Okay, welcome everyone. I'm so pleased to welcome you to our Creating a Culture of Inclusion, a fireside chat on removing barriers to disability inclusion. My name is Sandra Hawken, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the president and CEO of the Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. For accessibility, today I will be sharing a visual description of myself before we get started. I'm a middle-aged white woman with light brown hair that's long and tied in a ponytail. I have blue-green eyes with quite dark circles under them today after staying up all night with a sick puppy. I'm wearing a black shirt under a mauve blazer, and my background is white with eight Home Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital logos in blue and green. For those of you who are meeting Home Bloorview for the first time today, we are Canada's largest pediatric rehabilitation hospital and one of the only institutions in the world focused on combining clinical care, research, teaching and learning with the purpose of creating a world of possibilities for kids with disabilities. We also have the highest concentration of pediatric disability research anywhere in the world. Our mission includes a passion to ensure that all kids and futures, let all kids and youth live a full and meaningful life. And to that end, anti-stigma, disability inclusion, and advocacy for both is core to what we do. We've hosted many panels like this one, spoken broadly across industry and the media. Annually, we have PSA campaigns to talk about inclusion around disability, robust advocacy efforts, and more than 160 of Canada's largest brands have signed Holland Bloorview Foundation's Disability Inclusion Agreement. For National Accessibility Week, we decided to bring to you a fireside chat to share lived experience and together to create a more accessible Canada. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing the uh, two folks who are going to be steering that fireside chat. First is my colleague, Nathan, who is a Black advocate, public speaker, and ableism disruptor who was born with cerebral palsy. As officer partnerships at Holland Bloorview, Nathan fosters meaningful connections with community partners and supports all of our signature events. Based in Toronto, Stephen Irish is passionate about making a difference and driving change. With over seven years experience in disability and employment, Stephen leads Innova's business services team to achieve and deliver inclusive solutions. We're so grateful for Innova's generous support today and for Nathan's role as moderator. I'll now turn things over to the conversation um, where Nathan will begin with a land acknowledgement and housekeeping. I hope you all enjoy today's conversation and are moved to do your own work to remove barriers to disability inclusion. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sandra, for the really warm introduction. My name is Nathan Gabba, and I'm thrilled to be moderating today's discussion alongside our wonderful guest, Stephen Irish from Inova. A quick personal description of myself, I am a young adult black male with, I'd say, short to medium length hair. I am wearing a black undershirt um, underneath a black blazer. And I also have a Holland Blurfie backdrop that has Holland Blurfie Kids Rehabilitation Hospital along with our logo repeated about eight times. Before we dive into our general discussion, I'd like to take a quick moment to go over some housekeeping. For accessibility purposes, captioning has been turned on and the video recording with the caption video will be uploaded in months to come. I also want to share that if for whatever, uh, for any reason you might not be able to currently see the caption, you may have to click on the captioning prompt to do so. I also want to share that our chat is currently closed for the moment, but uh, approaching the end of our discussion, you'll be able to leave your thoughts as well. So um, this event will be recorded and only the panelists should be visible during the discussion. And we'll also have a Q&A feature. So if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to plug them in for our panelists. And any resources that we discuss during the, during the panel will be shared post events. Before we begin, I'd like to reflect on and acknowledge the sacred lands in which we operate, work, live, and play. The, le the legacy of Paul and Boerview's current space, where people have gathered for over 15,000 years, should inform our actions, especially in how we think about inclusion in the workplace. Paul and Boerview sits on the territory of the Huron Wendat First Nation, the Seneca, as part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Mississaugas of Scugog Island, First Nation, 
We recognize indigenous land titles as set out in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which envisioned self-determination and self-government. I want to honor these lands of visual, uh, sorry, I want to, uh, I want to honor this land's original people and invite everybody to think about the present day and the past of these communities and holistically question how some of our own personal colonial practices may be disrupting connections between families, communities, and homes. It is truly vital to make sure that we center our ideas around responsibility, reciprocity, and resilience in our work to make sure that we can be as accountable as possible to the treaties in which we are bound to. We are all truly capable of decolonizing the, our everyday ways of thinking and practices to combat oppression in any way that we can, especially in thinking about the experiences of people living with disability. So once again, I truly like to encourage everybody to just to truly reflect on the land in which you operate. And now before Stephen joins the discussion, I'd like to share just a little bit about myself. So I have had the absolute pleasure of working for Holland Worldview in both part-time and full-time roles in the past uh, four years of my life. And I can truly say that for me, this just means having a chance to give back because I have been a part of the Holland Worldview community since I was about nine months old. And today, um, my current endeavors looks like facilitating a lot of various conversations towards um, disability inclusion and anti-stigma. But every time I have a chance to go up there and share my story and have these my real life examples and utilize them in order to be examples for education, I think back to all the times that I went to Hall of Review for a physiotherapy or any other kind of appointment. I think about how are the services that I received truly exceeded our family's expectations in every way. And that's what helps me find the motivation to continue going and try my very best to lend my voice into various discussions like we're doing today. Today, uh, we're going to be diving into our own lived experiences and thinking about ways that we can overcome barriers to inclusion. We'll also focus on cultivating uh, an inclusive language and share resources on how to empower everyone in championing disability inclusion within our communities. Now I'm gonna be really happy and excited to pass the, the note over to Stephen Irish to introduce himself. Thanks so much, Nathan. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm excited for this conversation and to kick off uh, National Accessibility Awareness Week. Um, I'm Stephen Irish. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm the manager of business services at Nova. Um, a visual description of myself, I'm a white male uh, with brown hair. Uh, it's a little bit long at the moment, I could likely do with a haircut. Uh, however, I have blue green eyes um, and I'm wearing a dark blue uh, navy uh, collared shirt with white polka dots. Um, and my background is a bluish green uh, background uh, with the Innova logo. Um, so before I kind of, uh, before we jump into the conversation today, a little bit about uh, who ANOVA is. Uh, ANOVA is an employment strategies consulting firm focused on creating dynamic inclusion through innovative solutions grounded in research and founded on global best practices. Uh, in my role at ANOVA as business services manager, uh, I have the pleasure of getting to collaborate uh, across departments each and every day. Uh, to strategize, implement, and optimize Nova services and solutions. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. So when I think about our topic about creating a culture of inclusion, I think back to a common topic that I, that I noticed that truly resonates with most of our audiences where we have our disability-centered um, discussions, and that's typically just the barriers to inclusion and the different ways that they directly impact the lives of people living with disabilities. We typically uh, categorize these barriers as physical, attitudinal, and systemic. Today, I'm hoping that we can have the chance to, de to define these and unpack them together. So for starters, physical barriers commonly refers to an inaccessible design in an environment that can limit people's access to navigation. Honestly speaking, as somebody with a physical disability being cerebral palsy and who uses a mobility device to get around, I can truly say that I encounter these physical barriers to be quite honest, from the moment I wake up until I go to sleep. And doing different things about that um, during the day or week, like going grocery shopping or just trying to get around, for example, I noticed that there's been many times where I haven't really had the most easy experiences in accessing spaces. And that's why I think that once again, it's truly important that we are able to have these conversations because in order to, in order to see any kind of progress, things like this have to be highlighted as well. Um, 
before I share more examples, I have another, I have a quick question for Stephen, because we're also able to acknowledge that many businesses' ideas around um, physical barriers and becoming more accessible in their workplace is a little bit misguided because they tend to think that making a workplace a lot more accessible can be quite cost efficient. Can you shed some light on how you help your clients navigate this, Stephen? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a great question, Nathan. Um, I think at a, you know at a high level, um, it's important to reframe cost really as an investment in your employees, uh, your customers, and all stakeholders. Um, however, backing up a little bit, um, I think when approaching uh, accessibility, it, it's important to approach accessibility um, from a built-in perspective uh, and not a bolted-on as an afterthought perspective. Um, accessibility really should be a key component of the design process from the start, uh, and not as I not as I said before, an afterthought. Um, you know, in terms of um, accessibility being bolted, uh, built in and not bolted on, I think there was a really great example uh, in the recent report published by Canada's Chief Accessibility Officer, uh, where Stephanie outlines uh, an example of uh, the Employment and Social Development Canada uh, flagship location in Toronto. Um, when kind of developing uh, that office space, um, ESDC consulted with clients, employees, as well as an advisory network um, on inclusive services to help identify barriers as well as potential solutions. Um, in doing so, um, the new uh, Service Canada space um, has several accessibility features that are built in. Uh, these include adding tactile flooring and blind square beacons to help people with vision loss navigate the office space. Uh, equipping workstations uh, with video remote interpretation or VRI uh, to provide on-demand access to sign language interpreters for deaf and hard of hearing clients, as well as installing seating in the waiting rooms that can be lifted to make room for mobility devices. So the reason that I highlight uh, that example from the Chief Accessibility Officer's report is I think it provides a really great example of accessib accessibility being built in and not bolted on as an afterthought. However, back to my first point, um, I think for existing workplaces, investing in accessibility really fosters employee success and productivity, while simultaneously allowing for a better customer experience. When the question of cost comes into play, um, I think examples such as Stopgap, uh, which is a non-for-profit organization originating in Toronto uh, that developed a ramp for businesses uh, to allow individuals to more accessibly access the space is a really excellent low cost example of ways in which businesses can improve the accessibility of the built environment um, as ramps start at under $500. However, um, zooming out a little bit, I think accessibility features can also have a larger impact for many people uh, and not just for persons with disabilities. Uh, so for example, automatic doors not only benefit individuals with mobility devices, but can also benefit delivery workers, for example, that are carrying a package. Um, so by investing in accessibility, um, a business is not only ensuring that the space is more accessible for people with disabilities, but that it's also a more accessible space for everyone. Stephen, thank you so much. These are honestly such great examples that once again, like you said, disability, inclusion and accessibility should never be thought as an afterthought, but rather when we're actually planning new events or creating new, uh, creating new spaces, built in accessibility should be for everybody because it's generally salubrious for everyone, rather you have, if you have a disability or not. And this actually reminds me of a recent talk from Blurview Research Institute's uh, Dr. Timothy Ross, where he was actually able to look at our community spaces, services, and systems and how they impact the lives of uh, children with disabilities and their families as well. And within this really insightful discussion, Dr. Tim Ross looks at the accessibility of childhood playgrounds and he asks very thought-provoking questions like, how do we start? Can I get there? Can I play? And can I stay? Honestly speaking, this is a really phenomenal discussion, and we're going to have the chance to share this as a resource for the audience as well. Now that we had a chance to speak a bit about physical barriers, I'm going to shift gears and talk a bit about attitudinal barriers. So I want to start off by saying that attitudinal barriers are actually one of the most commonly faced barriers for the people um, living with disabilities. And this usually occurs when a people's unconscious bias or sometimes mis misinformed information or stigmas can allow them to have a mistreatment of people with disabilities or sometimes even exclusion. 
And it's also really important to, to, um, to note that attitudinal barriers can also correlate with the other barriers that we're gonna be discussing today. And the good news is there truly is no harm in learning or sometimes even unlearning certain things that can help us find solutions in removing these barriers. Um, Stephen, what social or attitudinal barrier have you encountered that you believe are currently hindering organizations or even just people in general from embracing greater inclusivity? It's a great question, Nathan. Uh, honestly, too many. Um, too many. Uh, it, you know, if I were to if I were to narrow it down um, into a, a few examples, um, I think one of the the biggest attitudinal barriers that uh, I, I experience is uh, a lack of recognition or awareness uh, around the diversity within disability. Um, a little bit of background uh, for the audience uh, uh, about myself. I started my career working with autistic youths and adults. Um, and this barrier often reminds me uh, in terms of the barrier of uh, lack of awareness around the diversity within disability of a quote from Dr. Stephen Shore, um, which is, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Mm -hmm. I really think that this quote does a great job summarizing the diversity within disability. Everyone is different. It's important to understand that the that the individual experience of one person is not the same as another. However, I think too often um, businesses paint people with disabilities with a really broad brush stroke. Um, so, for example, all autistic individuals are good with numbers or good with computers. Um, I think in reality, that's just not the case. Uh, and so it's really important to recognize that everyone's individuals um, and to not use that kind of broad brush stroke approach um, when discussing disability. I think another factor at play here is intersectionality. Um, often disability is just one of many identi uh, one of many identities an individual can have. For example, a person with a disability can be a newcomer to Canada, a woman, indigenous, and it's important to recognize that all of these identities shape a person's experience and the barriers that they may experience in the workplace. I think for organizations to really foster a culture of diversity uh, and inclusion, it's important for them to recognize the diversity within disability, uh, but also the impact of intersectionality. Another example uh, that I feel is worth speaking to is here is ableist stereotypes. Um, so I think that ableist stereotypes uh, have a tremendous impact on the employment of people with disabilities, um, but also present attitudinal barriers for organizations looking to foster a culture of diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. For example, ableist stereotypes that people with disabilities are not capable or reliable, or that they pose too much of a risk, leads to less people with disabilities in the workforce. Another kind of personal example here um, from my time in employment services, I remember when I was job developing uh, and I've had employers say to me, but Stephen, we can't hire him. It's a kitchen and there's knives around. It's not safe. I think as Nathan noted, while this can be unintentional or a result of lack of understanding, these type of ableist stereotypes really pose a significant barrier both to people with disabilities in employment, but also in organizing also in terms of organizations' ability to foster a diverse and inclusive workplace culture. The last point I wanna to touch on here as well is ensuring that people with disabilities are included in the conversation um, and of importance, paying them as well. Um, I think for organizations looking to improve disability inclusion, it's really critical to ensure that people with disabilities are part of the conversation, to consult with them, to ask them questions, to gain insights, to learn from their experiences, and as I said, to compensate them for their time and expertise. One, uh, in fact, one of the primary principles of the Government of Canada's Accessibility Strategy for Public Services of Canada is nothing, which, uh, nothing without us, which I think really highlights uh, the importance of ensuring that people with disabilities are part of the conversation. However, just being part of the conversation, um, I do not think is enough. Uh, I think it's really important that organizations carefully consider how to provide choices when engaging people with disabilities, while also ensuring that there's a clear pathway for their contributions and lived experience expertise to be incorporated and actioned. So to combat some of these attitudinal barriers, I really do believe that training and education uh, is a critical component. I think organizations should invest in training and education for their employees as a foundational building block to recognize and remove attitudinal barriers. 
Um, in fact, it is also one of the recommendations uh, made in the Chief Accessibility Officer's report uh, is for organizations to invest in disability inclusion training. In addition to training, I think experiential learning opportunities, such as Inova's Disabilities Mentoring Day, uh, provide a great opportunity to connect with and learn from people with disabilities, helping eliminate attitudinal biases, but also unlocking transformative potential for, the, for your organization. As Nathan noted at the start of the conversation, um, we will be sharing some resources at the end of the conversation today, uh, one of which will be some information on Inova's Disabilities Mentoring Day. Uh, and, those, and for those interested in learning more, I'd really encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's going to be a great event. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen. One really eye-opening reflection that I truly want to share just based off my own lived experience. And also when I do make this comment, I want to share that I am, I am only speaking towards my own personal experience. I don't mean to represent a community at all. But one thing that I've realized in terms of the kinds of barriers that I've encountered, I've encountered a fair share of attitudinal barriers. But I want to say that for me personally, I've noticed that it's generally been rooted in an ambivalent sense of ableism, meaning that people, when I have these interactions, didn't deliberately go out of their way to make me feel uh, excluded or they didn't deliberately try to say anything offensive, but it was actually more so a result of, um, I want to say, a lack of understanding about disability that led to some issues that unfolded beforehand. For example, I want to share, like, when I got to know many of my friends when I was in university, they would often tell me, oh, Nathan, I'm so happy that we're full now, but I wanted to, if I'm being entirely honest, there were so many times where I saw you around at Tim Hortons or in class, and I wanted to talk to you because you always seem to be laughing or smiling, but I was just really scared because I um, I didn't know if you had a disability like this by a senior walker and I didn't want to unintentionally say the wrong thing. So I kind of just avoided speaking to you and hung around you hoping that you would say something yourself. And the really interesting thing about that is just sometimes, I know that Stephen, we've talked about this before, but people truly have to be comfortable in being uncomfortable sometimes. And the thing with that is sometimes where when uh, a topic that you're not as familiar with can be really intimidating, we can sometimes have the tendency to be a little bit overwhelmed and stray away from it. And that's why, once again, having a chance to dismantle the different forms of barriers of inclusion and talk about it in an honest lens and authentic lens truly goes such a long way. And another statement that you made around intersectionality truly spoke to me because I can honestly say that that is what truly pushes me to be an advocate today is really trying my very best to lend my voice and sharing the, the message that there is no one size fits all when it comes to disability. I've had many times, despite once again, um, being a person with a physical disability that is quite visible because I use my mobility aid. Despite so, I've had a lot of people tell me that um, they didn't believe I had a disability because I don't look disabled. And growing up, that wasn't always the easiest thing for me to kind of wrap my head around because I think, well, what do you mean I don't look disabled? Mm -hmm. People with disabilities have so many different, very unique experiences. And in having these conversations, it made me realize that, you know what, this isn't a Nathan problem. This is a societal problem. And in me acknowledging this, I can't continue to be aware of this and not try my very best to have some sort of involvement to a solution. And that's another reason why I want to just take a quick moment to highlight um, my appreciation for Holland Review and allowing me to have a platform to have these dis discussions. Because at one point in my life, I can honestly say that I was definitely more so um, timid and nervous to speak about certain things because I've actually had some unfortunate altercations where, like I said, somebody didn't believe the validity of my um, disability. And I've had arguments with people where they said, oh, like, what are you doing is wrong? Or I've had the police called on me. I've had the police um, stop me and accuse me of taking my walker. And it's just like these really eye-opening experiences and having the chance to share it with people and seeing the way that they receive it. And they realize that, you know what? No, this can have very real life consequences. It's just truly mind blowing to see the progress that we're making collectively as a whole. And once again, disability inclusion is truly a collective learning experience. And that's why I'm so happy that we can all be gathered here together today and have a chance to just have a real genuine discussion. And then the next barrier that I want to speak about, which will be our last one, is systemic barriers. And this is where attitudes, practices, and policies in a system result in uh, certain individuals from different groups receiving un un sorry, unequal access to, ex to inclusion or participation for services or programs. So Stephen, another question I have for you, 
is what elements do you believe are important when advocating for building awareness towards disability inclusion in both public and corporate spheres? Yeah, it's another great question, Nathan. Um, and and just kind of looping us back a little bit, I, I could not have agreed more with with what you said there, right? I think that oftentimes, um, you know, in, in fear of saying the wrong thing, people people don't say anything at all, right? Um, which is oftentimes uh, just as bad, if not worse. Um, and so, um, you know, I really I really appreciated you highlighting that. Now, in, in terms of your question, I, I think to to build awareness for disability and inclusion and to advocate for people with disabilities, it's really important to take a multifaceted approach. Um, you know, realistically speaking, um, there still remain significant barriers for people with disabilities, both in the workplace and beyond. And while we've made um, tremendous progress, um, there still is a ways to go. Um, you know, 27% of Canadians or roughly 8 million Canadians identify as having at least one disability. That's a significant portion of the population. Um, and yet the rate of employment of people with disabilities remains lower. I think one element uh, of advocacy and awareness building that I'd like to highlight here is addressing unconscious bias. Unconscious bias or unknowingly discriminating and stereotyping can influence our attitudes, behaviors, and decisions without us even realizing it, perpetuating systemic bias. And I've noted a few examples of this earlier in the conversation. I think establishing an equitable, I think establishing equitable processes and support is critical to ensure that uh, is critical to address unconscious bias in the workplace. With equitable processes, personalized engagement can occur while still ensuring that the core elements of service, support, or information are consistent and equitable. In doing so, I think organizations can ensure that unconscious bias do not create interactions that can be experienced as unfair, disrespectful, or even harmful. I think another point that's uh, worth noting here is the power of language and how the language that we use when discussing disability or speaking to people with disabilities can further perpetuate barriers due to the unconscious biases that exist. Using, un using inclusive language in the workplace and beyond means making a conscious commitment to the words, phrases, and tones that break down barriers. In the workplace, inclusive language can elevate employee engagement, it can increase employee productivity, as well as improve the workplace culture. An inclusive and positive workplace culture influences how employees interact, collaborate, and innovate. To help promote inclusive language, I'd suggest starting with five simple tips. The first is, if you're unsure, don't assume, just ask, which I think really speaks to the point that you just made before this question, Nathan, around individuals just not being sure and instead not saying anything at all, right? Mm -hmm. I bet you wish that many of those people just came up and asked, started the conversation. The next tip I have is use neutral language. Uh, for example, you all versus you guys. The third tip is keep in mind the historical context. This can be a difficult one and it requires learning. And I think using inclusive language and promoting inclusive language, as Nathan mentioned before, really is an ongoing journey of continuous education and learning. Uh, it's not a simple one, two, three, done approach. The fourth tip is remember that language used by people within a community may be different and respect that. And the last tip, and this is one of the most important ones, if you make a mistake and are corrected, apologize, learn, and grow from the experience. Addressing unconscious biases and the use of inclusive language free from prejudices, stereotypes, and discrimi discriminatory views uh, of particular people or groups of people allows individuals and organizations to truly foster a culture of diversity and inclusion, not only in the workplace, but beyond. As I mentioned earlier in the conversation, I think training and education provides a really great foundational building block to build awareness and establish disability confidence. However, it's also important uh, to recognize that while training and education are vital, it's important for organizations to look to the next step, which really is meaningful action. 100%, I totally agree with everything you just said. And I have one more question that was a bit of a two-parter for you, but how do you see the general uh, perception of societal perception of disabilities evolving? And what, do, what, what role do you believe we play in shaping this evolution? 
It's a great question. It's a great question. And, and I mean, um, it's a, to be completely honest, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of how I envision societal perceptions of disability and evolving uh, really depends on the level of commitment people, uh, but also organizations demonstrate moving forward. Um, as I said during the, the first part of the last question, I, I think we've truly made some tremendous steps forward. Um, you know, the Accessible Canada Act uh, absolutely presented a step in the right direction, but much still needs to be done. Um, as noted kind of throughout the conversation, I think significant barriers still exist for people with disabilities, be it physical, attitudinal, or systemic. I think people and organizations need to demonstrate a clear commitment to continuous learning and improvement, as we've noted several times during this conversation, uh, including addressing unconscious bias, promoting inclusive language, and including people with disabilities in the conversation, as demonstrated by the Nothing Without Us principle in the accessibility strategy for the public services in Canada. Accessibility and disability inclusion is not a one, two, three, done approach. It really does require continuous learning on everyone's part and investment in that continuous learning. Individuals and organizations both play a role here, uh, and in fact, a really critical role. Uh, but legislation is also important uh, in driving change and holding organizations accountable. I do believe that if all parties demonstrate commitment to continuous learning and improvement, we will see a Canada that is more accessible and inclusive in the future. I totally agree. And honestly, that is a bit of a hard uh, question to answer simply because I know that I get this question quite often towards the end of many of my discussions is, Nathan, like, how do you see our, the general perceptions of society towards disability being changed? And I can say that there's still a lot of, uh, there's still a lot of room for progress, but being a person who grew up in a time where disability wasn't necessarily spoken about at all, and now seeing how we're having conversations in the workplace and corporate field as a whole, they're just in general, has been something that's truly so heartwarming and it means the world for me to have any kind of involvement in myself. Because as I often share, like I said earlier, I genuinely feel like most people truly want to be allies to people with disabilities. They just don't know the right way to go about it. And even sometimes in the ways that people try to start conversations with me, I can see past sometimes the harm forwards and see, see the interaction for what it is, which is someone's curiosity. And that's why it's really great that we have to be really um, embracing of people's curiosity as well and work as best as we can to once again have that collective learning experience. And since we both talked about how we're passionate about helping people become less uncomfortable with the topic of disability, we want to take a quick moment to just once again talk about disability and language. And I wanted to share two of the common approaches when people speak to um, about disability as a whole. So that being per, uh, people first language and identity first language. So I'm going to give an example of both. So with person first language, that would be me saying, hi, Stephen, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Nathan. I'm a person with a disability. And one way that um, people, one reason people might find this uh, to be a preferred uh, method is simply because there are many times where unintentionally or not, um, sometimes people might be only really acknowledged for that one aspect of their identity being, uh, being the fact that they have a disability. Mm -hmm. For example, I've had many times where I've gone out places with uh, family members or loved ones. Like let's say I went to a haircut appointment and somebody asks my brother instead of me what haircut I wanted. So I find that when I say I'm a person with a disability, it's just simply because I want to be acknowledged for the full aspect of who I am. On the other hand, I learned this when I began my uh, journey in advoca uh, advocacy as well, is that saying I am a disabled person holds so much strength to it as well because people really do acknowledge that the word disability shouldn't be this thing that we try so hard to avoid. There's nothing taboo about disability. Disability is just another aspect of, of life. And the same way that we can be proud of any other aspect of our identity, that most definitely applies to disability as well. And I can genuinely say that I really don't think that I would be half as confident as I currently am if I hadn't been born with cerebral palsy. And I would not have the guts to come in front of so many wonderful people and have a very vulnerable and open discussion with great people like Stephen as well. Um, I just want to make sure. Awesome. Policies around language can sometimes end up being harmful too, because like I said, this is still a ongoing journey where people might end up making unintentional mistakes. And that's why, like Stephen said, it is very important that we're having open discussion and sometimes making ourselves vulnerable and asking the uncomfortable question of, 
hey, I want to make sure that I'm going about this the right way. What way do you prefer I speak about your disability? And making sure that once again, like Stephen said, when we do have times where we might make mistakes and somebody shares that we have done so, to not be defensive, to not be too scared, not to not be too closed off, but to be open to the opportunity of having that collective learning experience, which once again is what I've learned through Holland Board View. Uh, the method of calling in rather than calling out and realizing that sometimes when we allow our emotions to kind of overcome us, uh, we can truly lose sight of what's going on right now. And what's going on is an educational experience where we can continue to just make sure that people are talking about disability in a truthful, genuine, and authentic manner. I also just want to take another moment to just say thank you so much, Stephen, and hearing all of your reflections and all of your answers to these questions. I'm thinking so much about how I'm going to continue to move forward as an advocate. A lot of the resources that you shared, I'm thinking about how I can implement it in some of the discussions we have, the future discussions we have with Holland Blair from as well. And I just want to say that thank you once again so much. And we're going to have the pleasure of actually opening the floor to answer some questions, which is something that I know that you and I are both very excited for. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, uh, Nathan and and the rest of the Hall and Blurview team, thank you so much uh, for having us here. Um, it was a great discussion. I'm excited for the Q&A period. But Nathan, I wanted to uh, just say there, I really like the calling in versus calling out. Um, I hadn't heard that before, um, but I think it, it it absolutely is so true, right? And, and you know, as, as you and I have chatted before, it, it's about getting comfortable being uncomfortable, um, I think is, is such a critical element of the conversation. Um, it's a journey of continuous learning. Uh, we, we can't act like we, we know everything, um, things are going to change. And it's, it's really about, um, as you said, calling in versus calling out. I, I really appreciate, I really like that. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Honestly, that was one lesson that I felt kind of hard to learn growing up, because like I said, being in many situations where somebody had looked at me and said that they didn't see me as disabled, that was sometimes uh, situations where I would feel a lot of different mixed emotions of like curiosity. Sometimes I would feel offended. I would feel hurt because there's so many different implications that, that falls underneath that. And often when I would ask the question of, well, why do you feel that way? What about the way that I carry myself or the way that I talk or act makes you feel like that invalidates my disability? And often people would phrase it in a way that they thought would be a compliment to say, oh, well, you hold yourself really strong or you hold yourself very confidently. And that in those moments, I feel like that is where I have to try my best to remember all of the things that we learn and practice what I preach. And remember that sometimes it might not always be the easiest, but it's kind of about removing our emotions sometimes in the moment to make sure that we're once again opening our minds to a collective conversation where we can learn. And Absolutely. once again, yeah. I would not know this without all of your view, despite living with disability my entire life. It's an ongoing learning experience. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Allison Hughes. I'm manager of partnerships at Holland Blurview, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'll give a visual description. I'm a white woman with short brown hair. I'm wearing black framed glasses and wearing sort of a reddish cardigan over a beige shirt and have a couple of necklaces on. Um, I'm going to help facilitate the Q&A. Nathan and Stephen, thank you for this conversation. Um, as I reflect as a disabled adult and also a parent, there's just so many takeaways I think that we can apply. Um, you give lots of examples of work, but they can really be applied anywhere. I think of raising my kids and how I want them to be inclusive and um, so many of the things we talked about around language, you know, it, I, I give pause when I read a children's book, is the language appropriate or do I need to substitute words? And I think I think we can really uh, look at kids and youth and the work we do at Home Blurview for kids and youth with disabilities and think about how um, how we can we can change our own practices in our in our everyday lives, but also how we're we're teaching kids and youth as well, with and without disabilities. Nathan, you just shared, you know, we don't we don't know what we don't know as disabled adults, and we're learning too on this journey. So um, thank you both for this meaningful discussion. We've had a few questions come in, and I encourage folks to continue to send in your questions um, if they come up. Um, there, this one's sort of a two-parter for um, employees and also um, employers around the way um, we can navigate neurodiversity in the workplace, um, highlighting folks' strengths, also communicating needs, um, and just 
how to navigate that uh, sort of aspect of it's not so obvious if it might not be visible and and how can employers both be more inclusive to folks with neurodiversity and how can someone with no neurodiversity navigate that workplace? Stephen, I know we've talked a bit about it, so perhaps you can share some thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm more than happy to kick us off. You know, I, I, I think one of the um, one point I wanted to note right off the right off the bat is it, it's important for um, employers uh, to not make assumptions about who their employees are. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, putting this into putting that point into the space of like workplace accommodations or adjustments, for example, um, you know, I, I see too many employers uh, kind of boxing in workplace accommodations and adjustments as specific to people with disabilities. Um, and, and I think in doing so, um, they miss kind of some of the, the, the larger point that workplace accommodations and adjustments are for everyone. Um, and, and then, you know, really on top of that, um, that they may have employees uh, within their current workforce um, that are people with disabilities, uh, but choose not to self-disclose that they're a person with a disability. Um, and so that that's one point I, I wanted to kind of note right off right off the bat. Um, I, I think in terms of neurodiversity in the workforce, um, you know, it, it really comes down to finding ways um, to identify skills, strength, um, and areas of expertise. Uh, and so the example that I'll give is, um, and, and full disclosure, I, I'm not a big fan of traditional resumes and interviews to start with. So, so I'll preface with that. Um, however, I think that one of the reasons why I, I'm not a huge fan of resumes is I don't feel like they do a great job um, really allowing individuals to showcase their skills, expertise, and experience um, in a non-traditional format. And I think that that's really important, uh, providing choices to employees, um, not only as part of the application process, um, but also part of their role, uh, you know, identifying areas where um, they'd like to develop professionally, or they'd like to uh, use some skills that they have that are outside of their traditional job description, um, but really, you know, skills that they do possess and in, in, in areas of the business where they can contribute. Um, and so I think that one way to do so is engaging with your employees. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, regular check-ins with your employees uh, from the time of onboarding uh, all the way through uh, the employee life cycle, I think is a really good way to identify areas where people may have skills that fall outside of that traditional job description or their description role, uh, but really are areas of the business that they can contribute uh, towards. And so that that's something that I would suggest businesses doing, um, you know, kind of circling back to the the application process, you know, at Innova, um, we've taken some pretty non-traditional approaches um, to recruitment uh, and to hiring. Um, we've given choices to applicants in terms of how they would like to complete that interview process, whether it be, you know, your standard traditional Q&A style interview, or whether it be showcasing a skill um, through something that they've developed uh, or other means. I think providing those choices uh, really allows you to meet people kind of in the middle uh, and to learn more about them and to see how you can kind of leverage those skills and strengths in the workplace. Thank you for that. That's super helpful. Um, I just want to make a note that in the chat, we're going to start sharing some of the links that uh, came up during the talk. So Dr. Ross's uh, talk is link is there. Our employer resource uh, hub is there. So that's something that we've created at Home Blurview just to give lots of resources for uh, employers to think about disability and, and, and learn a bit more. Our advocacy hub is also a great resource. And our next question sort of relates to the advocacy hub. Um, there's some teachers on the call today and they wanna bring awareness to their students um, about disability. They want to create awareness and understanding and empathy for everyone in the classroom. So they're asking for suggestions. Nathan, we spoke a bit about this. We've got the Advocacy Hub, which does have a section just for schools, which um, is a great tool. But do you want to speak a bit more about your experience with school outreach and what we do at Home Blurview? 
Uh, just in speaking with my experience with school outreach and having the chance to have any kind of um, impact on a children's educational journey when it comes to disability, it's just more so having the um, the honesty to embrace the fact that we all have um, unique ways of going about the way that we do things. Like for example, at Holland Burview, we have our staff profiles where each staff member uh, on the foundation shares a little blurb about the best ways that we work, some of the things that we may, for example, may need an extra time with, may need some support on. And it's just a really great and honest way that doesn't make anybody feel singled out, no one feels excluded because it acknowledges that we all have unique needs. And the times that I've had the chance to directly speak with um, children, it also reminds me that children are so passionate and so just genuinely lovely, like they want to be the best versions of themselves. Sometimes it's just our responsibilities as adults to help guide them and help give them that kind of comfort and saying that, you know what, no, it's okay. If you do something a little bit differently than your friend or your sibling, that's all right. We're going to find a way to make things work for you. We can all work equally as well. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's great. And I think, you know, what we've shared in the past through our um, advocacy work is the importance of representation and making sure that books we read children and movies we watch and TV shows we watch and music we listen to is reflective of um, the diverse community with which we live both disability and and other um, aspects as well. Um, Nathan, we've got a question for you. So I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. Um, it talks about people not believing you as a black man um, with a disability, um, that it might also be about anti-black racism. Um, so who gets to look and be believed as a, as a disabled person based on racial bias? So, they're wanting to know how we can make space for that intersectionality um, within the disability community when we think mm -hmm. about inclusion efforts. So um, happy for you to share a few insights yeah. on that. Yeah, for sure. I have, uh, I would just say like, for example, like even like in our advertising and sharing authentic experiences of people with disabilities, even just showing more black people that have disabilities because it is a reality. And I feel like in a lot of the interactions that I've had, like even sometimes, these were my peers who felt comfortable in making certain comments with me, where they would say things as, oh, well, Nathan, I don't see you as having a disability because you are Black. And I always have to constantly kind of remind them that, that one, one aspect of my identity does not completely eclipse another. And it's more so just showing people that, yes, it's just, just like everybody else. It's a part of life. This is an aspect of our identities. And just also doing our very best to amplify the voices of um, people with lived experiences who might be people of color as well, because I can genuinely say that for so long, I want to say like at least eight years, when I had all of these experiences, I never wanted to speak about it because I genuinely felt that one, people wouldn't necessarily relate to me, or two, I didn't want to stand out because everybody in my life had told me this was a Nathan problem. Oh, well, we can't go to the movies with Nathan without a security guard questioning if his walker is his. Or I couldn't walk home from work with uh, my friend because I would have occasionally, I would have a police officer slow down and ask me questions. And I remember thinking, oh, at the time, because I was younger and my world kind of revolved more around myself, I thought that, oh, wow, these are things that I have to go through. But once again, when we amplify the voices of people that have their own various unique uh, experiences, it might click and show people that, once again, disability can also take place at, at any part in a person's life. So disability is something that everybody should care about, to be entirely honest. So it's just having these real conversations, creating a platform for people to share their experiences and making sure that we actually have meaningful action once we hear these stories as well. And I also want to say thank you so much for your question. It really made me think. I appreciate that. Um, we're just getting comments to thank you, Nathan, for that really thoughtful reflection and for being vulnerable and sharing your lived experience. I think you're right. As um, a white, straight, cis woman growing up disabled, I didn't know my own privilege till I sort of did some learning and unlearning. And I think uh, that as I reflect, it, it is really important to have diversity in in these stories we hear and in our learnings and, and unlearning so that we don't you know, make assumptions about, well, if this person is able to do this or got this far or did this thing that everyone in that group should. Absolutely. And that's just like Stephen said earlier, you meet one person with a disability, it's one person. So 
I'm grateful to you both for thoughtful answers to all these questions and for this conversation today. Um, we'll give people a little bit of time back in their day and their lunch hour, but I want to thank you, Nathan, for moderating this discussion today and Stephen for participating. Thank you to you and the team at ANOVA. We're grateful that you took the time to share your lived experience and your expertise and providing examples and resources that folks can tackle um, disability inclusion and continue to remove barriers. We know that today's discussion is scratching the surface on a very big topic, and we hope everybody takes time to reflect, review the resources that we share, and continue their important work um, to keep conversation going and keep talking about disability. I'd be remiss if our team didn't acknowledge that donor support helps our partners, uh, from our partners and individuals, helps drive the work that we do at Home Blurview to address stigma and continue disability inclusion advocacy work. As the team continually works towards a more inclusive world for kids and youth with disabilities, we're grateful to our donors who help us make this work possible. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. We had a great turnout. Please watch your inbox for a post email with resources and in future we will share the recording. Thank you again, Stephen and Nathan, to our tech support team and to everyone who's tuned in today for working together during National Accessibility Week to create a more accessible Canada. Enjoy the rest of your day.